There are some social commentators who say the growth in the porn industry reflects a breakdown in Western culture. Is porn really that dangerous? I'm Mel Fletcher and this is Edges. Once upon a time, pornography was something peddled under the counter by shady characters you didn't really want to know. Today, pornography is big business. Porn movies, for example, cost a fraction of the budget of a major Hollywood release. Every year in America, 10,000 new titles are released. The introduction of home videos and the internet revolution have provided huge new opportunities for the release of porn. Experts say that the most popular sites on the web today are those dealing with adult content. That's industry code for pornographic material. Using the net, porn can be delivered into people's homes without anybody else being aware of it. Husbands and wives can carry on cyber relationships without the awareness of their partner. And children can download harmful material without their parents knowing about it. One company is now working on a computerized sex suit, which they say will allow people to stimulate partners via the internet. A friend of mine is a chemist. He has a bottle of cyanide in his lab at home. Cyanide is one of the deadliest chemicals known to man. It can kill a human being in just seconds. But if I take the lid off the jar, it's also one of the sweetest smelling chemicals known to man. It smells like almonds. Now I could change the labels on the jar from deadly poison to sweet almond juice, but that wouldn't change the danger of what's inside. The chemical would still be just as deadly. Now what's true in the natural realm of life is also true in the moral and spiritual areas too. Some people try to redefine pornography by using terms like erotica. They say that erotica is just the depiction of sexual things, while hardcore porn is a mixture of harmless erotica and harmful violence. But changing the label on the jar does not change the danger of what's inside. The human body and mind were simply not designed to take in certain things. Pornography is a form of moral, social and spiritual poison. It is not a harmless pastime. The word pornography actually comes from a Greek word that literally means the writing of prostitutes. I think we should reject pornography for the same reason that most of us reject prostitution, because it pulls down human beings. It makes them less than they are really created to be. Awesomely incredible human beings are reduced to nothing more than pleasure food who exist for nothing else than the gratification of others. Studies have shown that frequent users of porn suffer a breakdown in the way they see relationships. Think about it. If you're used to treating other people as objects whose sole purpose in life is to make you feel good, it can be very difficult to switch that off and treat people with mutual respect. That makes it very difficult to build any kind of meaningful relationship. It can be very difficult to start putting the interests of another person above your own. If you're using pornographic material to help you achieve sexual release, your sexual growth becomes very self-centered and that will affect your future sex life with a marriage partner the focus of the relationship will become self. Masturbation is based on gratification without relationship, on orgasm without love. And let's face it, love's the thing we need the most. In recent days, we've started to hear more and more about a condition called sex addiction. But what does that word mean? And if there is such a condition, how does it come about? Well, let's take an example from the world of gambling for a moment. Compulsive gamblers spend way beyond their limit simply because the process, the excitement of gambling, releases powerful chemicals in their brain. Those chemicals produce a feeling of euphoria or high. In a similar way, the theory goes, people will get involved in sex activity that may be harmful to them, simply because they become physiologically addicted to a euphoria or a high. The more they see, the more they need. People who've suffered like this say that their unhealthy use of sex is something that grew in stages. It might have started with pornography, but it progressively moved on to more and more dangerous forms of behavior. Before long, they found themselves in extramarital affairs or seducing their workmates or even making indecent phone calls. And above all else, they feel powerless to change their habits. One sufferer wrote these words, Our habit made true intimacy impossible. 
We could never really know union with another person because we were addicted to the unreal. We were first addicts, then love cripples. Fantasy corrupted the real. Lust killed love. Pornographers are always looking for new ways to spread their message and their material. And they couldn't have asked for a better medium than the internet. It's fast, it's affordable, and it's anonymous. Psychologists are now so concerned about sex on the net and the problems it brings with it that they're talking about cyber sex addiction. One expert said, sex on the net is like heroin. It grabs people's lives and won't let go. On the internet, pornographers offer people thousands of easy to access experiences with fantasy sex figures. Of course, these idealized partners are not like real human beings. They don't make demands and they don't have needs. They exist only for my pleasure. Cybersex ultimately is just a sham. It's never about relationship and it's never about love. And as with all pornography, the only real thing about cybersex is the pain it leaves behind. Cybersex is digging its claws into families and marriages. Men and women feel betrayed and abandoned and deceived when they find out that their partner is involved in cyber porn. One woman who discovered her husband was involved in net sex said this, how can I possibly compete with thousands of others who now exist inside his head? Whether you do it in the bedroom or on the PC, adultery is always soul destroying. With cyber porn, as with many other things, it's the children who suffer most. In one study, mothers were worried because their husbands were surfing the net when they were supposed to be watching the children. In some cases, children were able to see the pornography and even the masturbation that went with it. Children also suffer because marriages are placed under stress. Even if the marriage survives, it's very hard for a young child to get all the love and affection they need when one parent is addicted to cyber porn and the other is trying to deal with that. It doesn't matter what our background is, there's not one of us who hasn't faced temptation in the area of sexual fantasies. There's not one of us who can say that we've never had a thought which, if we carried it out, would lead us into some kind of unhealthy or harmful behaviour. The Apostle Paul in the Bible understood our predicament. He said, the good thing that I want to do is the very thing I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do is the thing I don't seem able to avoid. You see, the Bible understands our weakness, but it doesn't excuse it. Temptation's never the end of the story. It's what we do with the temptation that shapes what we become. Jesus himself was tempted in all kinds of ways, but he didn't give in to it. The Bible says we can take responsibility for our lives, and with God's help, we can renew our minds. The Bible concept of sin is about much more than breaking rules. You can keep all kinds of rules and never be a truly righteous person or a person with any character. Sin is really another word for spiritual poison. It just means taking into your system anything that works against the way you were made. If I commit adultery, for example, I will get hurt, and so will other people. I'm created in the image of God, who's compassionate and faithful and always keeps his commitments. So adultery works against the way I am wired, and that can only hurt me in the end. Moral poison will always do three things. It will always take us further than we wanted to go, keep us longer than we wanted to stay, and cost us more than we expected to pay. Ted Bundy was convicted of killing many women in the United States. Just before his death, he testified that his desire for assault grew out of a steady diet of porn magazines. He said, I got to the stage where I wondered if doing it would give me a bigger high than just reading about it. It certainly took him a lot further than he wanted to go. Pornography also costs us more than we expected to pay. We not only pay a price in our relationships, we also pay a price in the area of our self-control. According to the Bible, self-control is like a wall around the city of our attitudes and our thoughts. 
if you break down the wall in one corner, you become vulnerable to attack in other areas of your life. The more exposed we are to pornography, the more vulnerable we are to more dangerous thoughts and attitudes. According to Jesus, we bring forth actions according to what's in our hearts. If our soul is polluted by things like pornography and its distorted view of the world, we will one day eventually bring out those unreal images in some way. Guilt is like an emergency bell from God. When we hear it, we've got to stop what we're doing and turn around. We live in a world where we're surrounded by erotic stimulation and pornography. Sometimes it can seem very difficult to resist temptation. The Apostle Paul understood. He said, what a predicament we're in. Who can free us from this lower nature of ours? In the very next line, he gave us the answer. He said, thanks be to God, I can be free through Jesus Christ.